All right, we are now live. I want to welcome everybody to our next installment of Conversations with Commodores. And I have the man with the golden leg on the other line with me. Good evening, Jim Arnold. How are you, friend? I am good. I'm good and glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to be seeing you and thank you for spending a little time with us this evening. And I want to, I want to first start off, I wonder if you know this, I bet you do. You have the distinction of being from the same hometown or community as Marla Maples and Deborah Norville. Do you happen to know either of those ladies? <laughs> well, that is correct. Uh, Deborah Norville was a couple of years older than I am. Sorry, Deborah, at Dalton High School. And um, Marla Maples went to uh, one of the other county schools in Northwest Whitfield. So, and dated another guy that I knew during high school. So. I know of the, I know I know um, Deborah probably not well enough to pick up the phone and call, but uh, do know her. I know of Marla. Well, that's just a, a fun fact of being from Dalton, Georgia. But thank you for <laughs> for taking that little trip. And guys, I, I we've already got some folks rolling in. I want to welcome uh, Fred Baker, Sean Verner, Joe Staley, and. T.R. St. Charles. Staley, I believe, being one of your teammates, wasn't he? Absolutely. Very good. good well, guys, for those of you who don't know of Jim, and you really should if you don't, I also want to welcome, let's see, uh, Megan Steenberg Curto. And for, again, forgive me if I ever pronounce names incorrectly. I probably haven't met you personally, but I apologize ahead of time. But Jim, coming from Dalton, uh, was with the Commodores uh, from 19, I think the seasons of 79 to 82. Does that, that sound correct. right? That is correct. Well, before we get to your, your days at McGugan and, and then beyond, talk to us a little bit about life growing up in Dalton, Georgia, and how did you ultimately end up with Coach McIntyre uh, on the Commodores team? Well, uh, uh, the story goes, Dalton is great, was a great city to grow up in. It's a, really a small town, but a big football town and a great community. Um, back in the day when your coaches really demanded d discipline from their players. So there was no skipping practice without an excuse. There was no uh, goofing off in class and all of that. Um, and I had success there. I started... Um, playing high school ball and, and improved year over year. And then uh, then Mickey Jacobs came down um, and, rec and came to see me at a game. And then they invited me to Vanderbilt. Well, I come to Vanderbilt and um, go to a basketball game. My parents are up here. Um, meet Coach McIntyre. Talk to Coach McIntyre. And, and Coach McIntyre at that time says, Jim, uh, I've got a scholarship open for a punter this year. Um, I feel 95% it's going to be you. So I'm like, this is great. I'm going to Vanderbilt. I'm going to play in the SEC. Uh, didn't know a, a great deal about Vanderbilt at the time, but started doing a little homework. Well, now, did, you, not, did you grow up a Georgia fan or a Tech fan? Well, to be, be quite honest with you, in high school, I, I was probably more of a Georgia fan um, just from being down there in but that being said, I didn't I didn't really watch college football on Saturdays. I was out going and doing it with my buddies. So I mean, Friday nights, you, you know, it was a big deal uh, football in, in Georgia, and then uh, Saturdays was just hanging out with your buddies. Um, but anyway, at getting back to George telling me this, about two weeks later, I've not I haven't heard a word from Vanderbilt. I thought, wow, I, I would have heard something. So I call and uh, I talked to the the coach and. He says, well, now it's between you and a guy from Mississippi. Okay. I let that simmer for about a week. I call back. It's me and the guy from Alabama. And then me and a guy from, I meet in Georgia, Tennessee, and then the guy from, this goes on for about four weeks, then a guy from Kentucky. And so I called, and again, he throws another guy. And so I just said, why don't we just solve this? Why don't, why don't we do this, Coach? Why don't you have all of these guys We'll all come to Nashville, we'll all kick a ball. And we'll we'll go out and work out for you. And then you make a decision because I know what the decision is going to be. You're going to say, I want you, and you're going to want me as your punter on your team. Right. And right. Um, I was getting a little frustrated, but I did say that. And um, what was it? That was probably leading up to about 
uh, right about a letter of intent time. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we get to the letter of intent and, or maybe the day before, and Vandy calls me and um, asked me to ask me when I could sign. And I said, well, when can you be down, be down in Dalton, Georgia? And I can sign and they were down the next day. And that's, that's how that kind of happened to me getting to Vanderbilt. That's awesome. And you know, it's interesting how each decade or every so, so, so many years, they change the process. In the 80s, you were faxing your letter of intent in. In, in the 90s, it was a little different. Now they have, you know, everything's online. But yeah. back in, in at your time, they came to you and signed with you. And I think that's, and was it Coach Jacobs was the coach who yeah, came? Yeah, Coach Jacobs came to, to my hometown. Um, we had the, the official signing at a local um, restaurant called the Oakwood Cafe. Been there uh -huh. forever. And that's where, actually, that is a, tr a tradition in Dalton, Georgia, because most guys who, have signed letter of intents or scholarships to play at college ball have done it there. So it was neat. What a great tradition. That's pretty yeah. cool. Is it still a restaurant in town? That, it is still operating? there. Oh, very cool. I bet your picture's still on the wall somewhere. That's awesome. Right. It may be. I don't know. It might be back toward the restroom or something. Well, I want to want to welcome OJ Fleming, my buddy, or everybody really, in uh, from the Franklin and Nashville area, and Ed Zaborowski. I want to welcome you guys in to watching us and having a good talk with, with Jim Arnold, the man with the golden leg. Uh, hey, Ken, uh, Kim uh, Hammond is also joining us, so thank you. Hey, uh, Kenny. So, Jim, you, you transition, you come into to that fall camp your freshman year, or did you start any early in the summer after your senior year? No, I came in fall. And that fall, were there any other punters on the roster at that time? There was. A guy named Cody Witt was on the roster. And uh, Cody had been here. I, I can't remember what year Cody was. And I'm sorry, Cody, if you're listening. I apologize. Um, but um, I wanted that job. And Cody was here. And um, I think that at first when I got here with my punting, I was, I was kind of pressing a little bit. I was kind of wanting to over-impress. So I so I would have the, the position. So about a few weeks into it, um, once everybody's there, Coach Mike came over and just said, hey, Jimmy, relax. You're my guy. Mm -hmm. And I guess from that point on, the as they say, it was, it was history. Well, who was in your – because you had a very talented recruiting class who you came in with. Oh, yes, share, those guys were awesome. Some, share some of those names because I know a lot of folks – who are watching or will watch this later on are going to recognize. Well, uh, my two besties uh, that I had there were Joe Staley, Pat Sandin, um, John Clemens was in that class. I'm trying to think of guys who, who played quite a bit. Terry Dugan was in that class. Um, good Lord, now you're testing my memory and I'm kind of half Alzheimer's. Was Alma in your class? Or yes. Was he already there? Alma no, he was in our class. Man must have caught 150 touchdown passes in his career. Uh, oh, yeah. what about, was Witt Taylor part of your class? He was not part of my class. Witt was redshirted. So he, he, he graduated with me, but he was there a year before. Here's yeah. a coincidence with Witt and I and how mm -hmm. we became really good friends was Witt was from Shelbyville, Tennessee. My father was from Shelbyville, Tennessee. So I still had grandparents at the time um, down in Shelbyville. So that's how... Uh, Witt and I became uh, really good friends. Excellent, excellent. So that first year, you've got uh, Coach Mack as your coach, as the head coach, and he wasn't he your coach the whole time through? Yes, he was there the, the whole four years that I was there. And I know at least two of the years, maybe your junior and senior year, Watson Brown was the OC. And yes. he, later, he later was my head coach a few years later. I was in his first class in the fall of 86. Yeah, but and he's a, that, that's a great man too, right there. Um, he, you look you look back at those two years um, mm -hmm. with us, and I can tell you, no offense to to Coach Mike, um, may he continue to rest in peace. But I think the success of our program, and I think that a lot of guys will express this as well, is the success that we had with that that class, my class coming in into seniors, uh, was due to Watson Brown being there, and of course Doc Crease. 
Doc was a big motivator and got you got you working and get stronger and faster and everything. But those two. There was one one game in particular, and I'll get back to the '79 season. But in that '82 season, when you guys went to the bowl game, went eight and four, you beat Florida. Coach Brown and the the offensive brain trust decided to start or play Jim Pop at that other tight end, and it slowed down Wilbur Marshall, who was yeah. the All America, and he ended up in the pros against Florida, and y'all beat them pretty good. But one of your former teammates and one of my former teammates, Carl Parker, CP, just signed on. Hey, CP, what's up? And so did Boo Mitchell. Hey, fellas, good to see you. What's guys. up, Boo? Thanks for dropping in for a few minutes. Talking with Jim Arnold, we're talking about the fall of 79, his freshman year. Wasn't a, on the scoreboard, it wasn't a very productive year, but let's talk about your year specifically, just you. Okay. Where did your where did your coaching, where did your technique, how did you hone in your skills? Where did, was it all just the way God made you, or did you have some coaches who really showed you the way? Well, I, from the standpoint of being at Vanderbilt, I think that you know I had a God given talent, um, and I and I mean that sincerely. I, I just had an ability to kick a football. And I had worked on that diligently through high school because I saw that that might give me an opportunity at the college level. It turns out that it did. Um, I come to find out years later that um, when I first got there, Coach Mack would always come over when I was kicking. And later he told coaches, he said, I don't want any one of y'all talking to him. This, this is my player. You're not to talk to him about his kicking or anything else. And all... And all Coach Mack would do, which was really good for me, um, was he would observe. And if there were times that I got out on the practice field and, and things were not all together, he had a knack of saying, looks like you're doing this. And in doing so, okay, that makes sense. I'll make a little correction. Now I'm back to where I was before and getting there. So I didn't really have... I wouldn't say I had any formal coaching at the college level as far as technique or mechanics or anything like that. I just really, really, really worked at it. And um, so I get here my freshman year. Um, we go one in 10. Um, for our class, it was, you know, it was something that, that put something down inside of us that made us really burn to excel. So, and we would push one another working out too, which I thought was really good. It, but from that, after my freshman year, I think um, I made uh, my freshman year, I made second team all SEC. And um, I think I made uh, an honorable mention in an all American category. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. I, I'm done. I've done okay. Now, let's see what we can't do if we kind of raise our standards of working out and get preparing for the following season. And I did. And then it went to being first team all SEC, my sophomore, junior, and senior year, and then my senior year um, of becoming an All-American, and then, you know, statistically being ranked not only high in the conference, but high in the nation as well, um, and that kind of got me there. But Well, Jim, I don't, I don't want to, to put you in a category from a, a date standpoint of playing, you know, as long ago as we both did, mm -hmm. but... There's a lot of things that punters did in the 70s and 80s that punters still do in current times. Right. And I want to talk about that just a little bit. I know that each generation, the, the working out and facilities and the kids are all bigger, faster, stronger than yes. we ever were back in the day. But some of the mechanics and some of the basics of kicking a ball never change in my opinion, but you're the expert. So I kind of want to talk about that before we get back into the seasons. Okay. What do you see now that you also saw and did during your time when you were at Vanderbilt? Well, your mechanics, like you said, the mechanics stay the same. That's going to stay the same no matter what. Um, probably back in my era, there uh, today you see kickers who are kicking um, the nose drop for inside the 20 or hanging it up for inside the 20. You saw a little bit of that in my era. You probably saw a little more of the corner kick, which has really kind of gone away 
um, in today's game. And the, one of the big things you're seeing now is the run out kick or the rugby style kick, um, which I honestly, I hate. I think it's ridiculous. I think that the reason you're using it is because you're not coaching well enough up front for lanes for in discipline getting down the field. And it's a compensation to give them a few extra steps getting down the field to compensate for a ball that's not quite as high. Um, that that came out of really your rugby, not your rugby style, but your Australian rules type of kickers. Those guys have had very, very strong legs and could execute those kicks. And so what has happened is you have coaches who say, oh, let's just, we'll try and do that. You know, maybe we can have the ball to get the guys get down the field a little bit quicker and give us less of a return. But what has ended up happening is that in the punting game is all about the exchange of field position. So if I'm not exchanging that field position in a way, I'm actually losing yards in a game. So when I played at Bandy, there early on there were a lot of times that we were well on the other side of our side of the 50. So my whole there's your dog or Yeah, I got two active dogs outside. <laughs> well good. <laughs> Give them a they, they, like anyway, to, um, they like to welcome the neighbors. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So my That's no problem. <laughs> um, in my day, I was I always looked at things probably a little different than most punters. I'm coming into a situation in the game, and what can I do to get my offense out of trouble and help my defense be fired up? Now, I want to I want to say this because guys who are watching may or may not have played on my punt teams. I could not have done what I did in college without the 10 other guys in front of me during the game at all. They really helped me look well, look good. And so from that standpoint, you, you say, okay, what, where's my exchange of field position? Have I got my team out of a hole? If I'm kicking and I'm standing on my goal line, it means my, my snapper's at the 15. If I'm not getting the defense, the ball past the 50, I'm really not doing my job. And that puts your defense in a, you know, in a little bit harder situation of trying to hold a drive from any kind of points, whether it be three or seven. So well, I, I see it differently now um, in that regard. Most of that time, you know, you were, if it was an inside the 20 kick, you were either going at the corner <clears throat> or you were trying to hang it up. In today's game, there are a couple of different um, things, although mechanics have stayed the same, where they're kicking the 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 point of the ball's down, so it goes almost like a kickoff. Right. Um, which, if it's not fielded, more times than many can, <clears throat> excuse me, makes it back up. Um, so you've got that. That's the predominant inside the the twenty kick now. Um, so you don't see as much corner kicks or just trying to hang it up. Well, that's, I want to ask you about that, and I want to welcome Gary Gerson, Aunt hey. Harold Lurcius, Byron King, Cal Jumper. we got a bunch of folks who've jumped in. Awesome. Here. This is a great crowd. Well, Jim, the, is flexibility and stretching still as important to most punters and kickers as it was back in the day? I think it is. I, I think back in my day, um, I'll give you a funny story about uh, scouting combine and pros. But anyway, um, I was not a guy who, if I came out on practice field and we're going to, we're going to stretch, you know, before practice or anything, and you looked at me, you'd go, my God, how's he kicking the ball? Uh, but on game day, I think it was adrenaline that really helped me be able to have flexibility in the, in the moment um, to be really good. Cause I'm not, or nor have I ever really been, uh, from a, a, a position of static stretching, a flexible guy. Never really have been. I'm not one that's going to reach over and touch my toes unless I bend my knees. It's just not going to happen or unless I fall down. Well, your follow through, I think that there's some great pictures from not only the Vandy years, but from in the pros where you really have just your, your left foot is up off the ground and your right foot is just so so straight and up in the air. It's just very impressive. But but one of the things that has always impressed me about punters is that when you able to, to just turn the ball over, when it gets that arc 
and it turns over on its flight, and that's when it's like a missile at times. Yeah. And that, that just seems like a real talent that you have to hone over time. It's one thing to make the ball go up, but then to yeah. get it with that turnover, it just seems like that's the thousands and thousands of kicks that nobody watches you do, but you're right. there in solidarity and you're going and picking up those 10 balls and hunting them back the other way. How did you that, deal that, with the, the solitude of doing that all those years? Oh, it didn't bother me. It's fun. I've, I've done anything from kick on a practice field to kick in a horse pasture and shovel to get ready. So it, it never really bothered me. Um, just getting out there and knowing, knowing I had to get these kicks in at this time or this number of kicks in at this time, depending on what period of the off season you're in to prepare. And then in the season, just to work on things to make sure that I've, I've still got the consistency going. And part of what you were talking about is being able to kick a ball and then have that nose turn over has to do with not only the mechanics, but how am I, how am I contacting the ball? Um, the contact of the ball is good, and the mechanics and the contact of the ball are going to help determine if that turns over or not. The other thing that's very important is what you talked about earlier is the follow through. Because the follow through not only gives that ball, it gives it lift as it goes downfield, but it also gives it the distance. Anytime I'm, I see a lot of kids today who are a little bit abbreviated. They're not, you know, maybe they're a flexible person, but the follow through is far more abbreviated. They may have a very strong leg and put the ball down the field, but where they're missing is without that really, really good hang time, I mean, really, really good follow through, is they're, they're losing out on, on some hang time. Do you follow any of the, the kickers and the pros these days? Well, uh, I do follow, uh, I've been following Sam Martin who played at Appalachian State, and Sam was, was with the Lions for about seven years, six or seven years, and now he's signed with the Denver Broncos, and Nowadays, it's, you know, in the NFL, everybody, free agency, if I get a chance to go to another team, make a little more money, um, then that's what they're doing. And, and I don't necessarily blame them for that because today's contracts are millions and millions of dollars. So, I mean, these guys are, they are getting paid like a factor of 15 higher than what I ever made when I was playing. Well, I was going to say, you played through the 80s into the early 90s, and the money is so different now. The, so, the, so probably cool. through the, the CBA and what was permitted and what was agreed upon about changing teams, free agencies, and trades, that's a whole generation ago. I'm not trying to date you uh, from oh, a no, no. standpoint, but it's just, you're right, it's a whole different, it's a business for every player now. Uh, yes. But I, I want to welcome Brian Donnelly, Gary Rogers. Gary Gerson's got a good comment here, Jim. What is that? <laughs> he said he really wants to comment on what you said earlier. Looking back, most of what you said was to get the offense out of trouble. Coach Brown, with his very special offenses, had to take a lot of chances, and sometimes it just didn't work. Instead of being pinned deep, Jim would put the ball well past midfield to let the defense do its bend but don't break magic. And that's what I was going to lead to. Your mm -hmm. freshman year, 1-10, your sophomore year, 2-9, 81, you guys go four and seven. You got Whit Taylor behind center, Coach mm -hmm. Mack, Watson Brown's the OC. And then you guys really put it together in 82 for a real special eight and three season going into the bowl game. You beat that dreaded team from Knoxville. And I want to talk yes. about that season for just a little bit. But before okay. we get there, what I don't know, you had a 79 yarder against Ole Miss, but I don't know which year. I want you to talk about that. Oh, jeez. You're most, I, don't ask me to remember a year. Um, was, that it might have been, or was it at Ole Miss? It was at Ole Miss. Very good. That so might have been junior. I can't remember. Junior okay. year. And that was like hitting a home run ball. I mean, it really was. Um, I felt good about, you know, I always felt good about going out on the field no matter where we were. And um, I can remember that one to this day because you, you get out there, as, as far as I'm concerned, I get out there see what the defense is trying to do, and then I'll lock in on the ball. And I got it, and here it goes, and I came through it just nice and smooth. It hit so sweet on my foot. And, you know, follow through, and I'll look up, and this ball is gone. And I was like, holy cow. Well, I kicked it, and the guy couldn't get back to get it. And I think it hit, 
uh, maybe inside the other 20, and it rolled all the way through the end zone and hit the back of the end zone and came back a little bit. So, uh, you know, you're looking back on that, why couldn't you put me on the one that had been a 99-yarder? Right, <laughs> but right, right. But it was, I think it was a huge, um, you know, you do something like that to your with your team, and I think that gives your defense a big boost. And anytime you can have a boost like that in the game, that gives them a little extra energy inside, a little extra adrenaline to go out there and make something happen. Um, it really makes you feel good to be able to do that for your team. Well, that if that was at Ole Miss, that was a 27-23 win for the Commodores your yes. junior year. Had you ever I hit a ball junior. that sweet that far before? I don't know that I had hit one that far before uh, that. I've had... I've had games where, you know, I had 60, 60 plus, but as far as really, really going over the 70 mark and almost 80, um, not before then. I'd had, I think I had one back in high school that was a 73 um, yarder, um, but I don't, prior to then, not that far, no. Well, I know that that, that, uh, that really was a momentum shifter for that type of uh kick and was talked about heck we're talking about it now and it's been a couple of decades but let's let's kind of you guys go to the bowl game against air force and that's a loss here in town at, at the, the hall of fame game at legion field but then you get drafted in the fifth round by the lions and no. i mean by the chiefs i apologize yep. no and worries leading up to the draft Things are so different. There really wasn't a combine of any sort. Was there a pro day that you worked out, or how did you come in contact or even know that the Chiefs were interested in you? Well, as far as knowing the Chiefs, I had no idea. Leading up to the draft, we had had scouts, you know, come through Vanderbilt. I'd gotten familiar with a couple of them that I knew that were – back then they were, you know, with a scouting combine. So you might have had it one – one scout that was representing four or five teams, um, another one represented another four or five. So I got to know these guys. And um, there were a couple of teams that I thought that I might have an opportunity um, to be drafted by. And I uh, don't mind sharing that. I thought Dallas would have been one of them. Um, the Danny White got racked on a punt, and I knew that he was a starting quarterback, so they didn't really want that happening anymore. Um, the guy that they had at the time in Atlanta was not really performing real well. So Atlanta was another team that I thought would have a good opportunity. And then we get to uh, draft it. But, oh, interesting. Back then, you know, you have the, the big production of the um, combine now. When I was there, we had three combines. They had one that was in Indianapolis, one that was in Seattle, and one that was in Dallas. Yeah, I think that's correct. So, no, excuse me, Detroit. Detroit, Seattle, um, Indy. And I went to two of the three, so which that was a big one. That was big to be able to go to two. Um, and then draft day, I'm sitting around, and everybody I talked to prior to that had looked at me. It told me they thought that me and Reggie Roby would, could, go as po could possibly go as high as the second or third round. Now so I got to ask you. Did you did did you also wear a watch like Reggie? Roby? No, I did not. No. Did you know Reggie? I think he played at Iowa uh, in, yep. in college. Did you know? I did him not know him in college. I got to know him in the pros, and um, then Reggie moved here uh, to Nashville and was working with Backfield in Motion. So I got to kind of rekindle our friendship there. And then, unfortunately, um, it was shortly after that that he passed. So it was uh, very sad. I. Did, I hate that when it happens to any former player, but um, I thought things were really good. Um, really enjoyed having him here in town. And I know we talked about this at a, at a golf tournament that I think from us coming out there, even though we didn't know each other, it, we were kind of, we were friends, but we we're also kind of arch rivals, if you will, in that we we're both seeing what the other one did which pushed the other one to try to be better. And I'm thankful for the Reggie Roby being in my era because he pushed me to be a better punter uh, at the collegiate level and at the pro level. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but let's go back to what we were talking about. You go to two of the three combines. 
and you had been in touch with some of the teams, or at least from their liaisons. So when was the draft held back in, in uh, 83, your year? It, I think it still was in that April time frame. Um, it might have been a little so were earlier. We, I'm were sorry? you on campus or had you gone home to Dalton? No, actually, um, Joe uh, Staley was with me and Pat Sainan was with me. And mm -hmm. um, I think I'm the only player that had a two keg party for the draft. <laughs> so we went through the first day and um, I didn't have anything happen. So the second day, because the first day is usually, was usually consumed by first round because you had so much time in between picks. And then mm -hmm. your second through fifth or sixth, I think back then they had 12 rounds or so. And um, yeah. so we went back uh, to a friend's house and had, um, had some more beer, waited to see, watching. And then finally here I get a call from the Chiefs and you know, it's draft day. And you're, you're so excited to have the opportunity to play in the NFL. And the Chief says, well, we're thinking about taking you at 119 here, which was the fifth round. Do you want to be a chief? And they, no, no, I'll just wait and play for, no. Yes, I want to be a chief. Yes. So I was drafted by them in the fifth, uh, first punter taken that year. So I was very, um, very happy and excited to be going to the NFL. And at that time, John Makovic was your coach? Yes. Talk to us a little about dealing with Lamar Hunt, the the longtime owner of the Chiefs. Did you have a lot of interaction with Mr. Hunt? Didn't have a whole lot. I had enough to, you know, shake his hand, say hello, and him know that I was on the team. But as far as real conversation, I would say that I had far more conversation with Bill Ford up in uh, Detroit than I did with Lamar Hunt in Kansas City. Well, you transition from Dalton to Nashville. You're transitioning now from Nashville to Kansas City. You just keep moving north up the up 65 <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But what did you take from your college experience that translated? Now you're a professional. You and Alama get get are drafted that year from Vanderbilt. He was drafted, I think, in either 11th or 12th round. Yeah. But you're now headed to Kansas City. You're going you sign your contract. You're a professional. But what did you, what skills, what um, approach, if any, did you use or utilize that you had learned your days being a Commodore that translated and helped you out as a, as now a Kansas City Chief in the NFL? A lot of the same thing. Now, when I got out there, um, they had mentioned that they wanted you to be, you know, live in the community. So, um, one, one, make sure I make the team before I make any kind of big moves. Um, which I did, and then I ended up buying a condo. So from that standpoint, what I just did was I kind of did what I've done before. Um, you know, it's just a different facility, different environment. Um, the thing that was different in Kansas City my freshman year is, um, I mean, my freshman, my rookie year was I came out of college of just being a guy punting the ball down the field um, who – was able to put good hang time on the ball to help my punt team cover. And in Kansas City, my rookie year, they really wanted me to do a lot of directional kicking. So this was kind of new to me. And that transition was a little difficult because I, I felt like what happened was it, it kind of it messed my footwork up a little bit. It um, made for a year that was not uh, the best on, on record for me statistically. And then we we get through that year and the second year I come in and they say, um, Jim, we're just going to let you kick the ball down the field this year. I'm, okay, great. Well, I think I ended up being, you know, top two or three in the NFL and top of my conference in punting. And um, I think I was even second in net in the whole league. Now, so here we are. I'm think you're thinking we'd learn something, right? <laughs> my third year, they went back to doing what they did the year before. So I, you know, maybe changing, not. changing philosophies change makes the punter adjust. But I have to ask you, when you when you first showed up at Kansas City at the at whether it was the the fall camp, were you still driving that that Datsun that you drove around Nashville? No, I took my son, signing bonus. I bought me a little BMW. I thought I was I thought I was pretty it was something then, but you found you out that was not the vehicle to have in the Kansas City winter. You, you had arrived, you had arrived. 
Now, now back in the in the 70s and 80s and even into the into the two 2000s, there were occasional punters and, and really more kickers who kicked barefooted. Not very many of them, but a few. Uh, Russell Erskleben, uh, Tony Franklin, Rich Carlos. There's a few others. But did that ever enter your your thoughts? Did you ever entertain kicking barefooted? Oh, I might have done that in high school in the practice field, just screwing around, but mm -hmm. not not to do it uh, full time. No, because you knew you had to end the season games, and uh, if I ain't got something on my foot, it's just gonna get colder faster. And, um, and when you get to the NFL, you're playing a little deeper into the year than you did in college. And believe it or not, some of those places you go are very, very cold. Yeah, I would say that uh, there weren't as many domes, and, and I don't know how many there are now versus then, but sure, playing in the north, Lambeau Field for one, when you played for the Lions, that was a, a rival. Um, I do want to welcome Stormy Webster. I want to welcome Fred uh, Nicole and some others who have rolled in. So thank you. I'm talking with Jim Arnold. Jim, we've gotten to the point where we're in the pros now. And mm -hmm. let's let's talk about, did you have any, during the years you played for, was it 12 seasons for the Chiefs, yep. the Lions, and you finished, I think, with the Dolphins, which is a Correct. huge difference in venue and, and temperature oh, yes. for you compared to the North. But did you ever play with any other Vanderbilt teammates or, or other Vanderbilt guys either with them or uh, competed against them and maybe saw them, uh, you know, post-game or off-season? Yeah, I remember my rookie year going in the league, um, we played Philadelphia, and Bernard Harrison, Bernard Wilson and Dennis Harrison were with the Eagles, and they came up to, to me and said hello. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of the Gaines brothers was in Seattle, uh, one of the older, Greg, I believe. Greg, who and, played at that other school, I think, but yeah. <laughs> and uh, and what was really weird about that was knowing, you know, Chris and the and the Gaines family, mm -hmm. um, again, in pregame warm-up, he comes over and kind of welcomes me and says, hey, and I, I just thought that was really cool and very classy mm -hmm. of all of those guys who were, you know, former Vandy or, or Nashville guys to come say hello to you. Um mm -hmm. It was kind of funny, and um, we had a couple of Nashville referees in the league. Mm -hmm. uh, Art Demas was uh, an umpire, so he would have been behind me. Mm -hmm. And then Don Orr and um, Boy Smith. But a funny story was in Kansas City, we're playing against Tampa Bay. And so my responsibility is kick the ball, and I'm kind of a safety valve on a return. So I launched this kick, and... I can see the guys getting down there, they tackled him, and all of a sudden, well, Art was my umpire. So here's Art, and I'm just kind of coming down the field. All of a sudden, I get whacked in the back like you read about, and I mm -hmm. go ass over tea kettle past Art. Mm -hmm. And I get up, and I look back at Art, and I said, Art, you're a Vandy guy. You're supposed to be taking care of me. <laughs> because I didn't see it. I said, you, you couldn't feel the air go by your ear as my foot went past? <laughs> anyway, that's, that was a running joke with me and Art for a long, long, long time. So. Very, very funny. Boo Mitchell said he was honored to wear number six after you at Vanderbilt. Well, thank you, Boo. You did a, you did you did that number justice, my friend. He sure did. You both did. Ed Parrish, D.C. Crosby, Jason Tomachek have all joined us now. J.T., my man. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we're talking. We're now in the pros with Jim. Jim, punting inside of dome stadiums, there had to have been that itch by every punter. I'm going to hit the, that speaker or that scoreboard or whatever's up above. Talk to us about your attempts and, and, and your experiences doing that, either pregame or during a game. Oh, we love to do that. And, then, well, going back when, when, when I was at Vandy, uh, we go to play Tulane in the Superdome. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah. Um, in practice, I ended up hitting the gondola uh, awesome. up there. So it, when I get to Detroit, what was interesting in Detroit is because it was an air suspended ceiling. But during the holidays, it, they would hang a tree from the middle of that. So my, I, I was always trying to hit that tree. Now, I never quite got to it because it was way up. Um, but I loved kicking indoors what, and had opportunity with the Superdome, the Astrodome, the Kingdome. Um, 
what am I missing? I didn't get to play a little Casola where some of you have indoors now, but um, I always love that opportunity. And the interesting story is that I told you on those um, uh, combines, we had one in Detroit. And Reggie Roby and I were in Detroit kicking. And um, so we see speakers hanging down that they kind of lined on the end, uh, the outside of the field toward the stands. So we looked at one another, so let's try to hit the speakers. So we were going at trying to hit the speakers. We didn't care whatever. I mean, we knew it was going to be a great kick if we are trying to do it. Yeah. And then uh, I guess it was after my fifth year in Detroit, our head trainer came up and told me, he said, you know those speakers right there? I said, yeah. He said, you know that they moved them up and toward the um, crowd after you and Reggie were here for the combine? I said, no, I did not know that. That's awesome. And, but that's a fact. So that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about your NFL days. Okay. You've got to have some stories that are at least PG-13 that you can share that either they're on the field or off the field and people just, you know, sometimes they say that life is, it's just, it's, it's so strange you wouldn't believe that this happened or that happened. So really, I'm just kind of throwing it to you to share a little bit of your experiences for us guys who we've only sat in the stands and watched you guys play and are curious yeah. about that that type of uh, existence. There's, I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff and stuff that's not. Um, uh, one of the one of the stories I'll tell when I go to Detroit, Kansas City comes to Detroit to play, and mm -hmm. so there were guys on that team that I were I was really close to at the time, wouldn't say a word to me before the game. And I thought, okay, I see how it's going to be. So we get in the game, and I have a kick. Um, I hang this thing up, and the guy doesn't want to fair catch it. And my guy, one of my guys, tags him pretty good. And I can't remember if he went out of the game or if he's back in the game. But about the third kick, um, on my third punt of the game, I really put one up in the air. And one of their guys had come and engaged our out, our outside guy, our gunner. And he ended up getting blocked into the return guy, and it ended up being injured. And then here, two or three of my buddies on the team, I finally just looked at him. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I told him on the first one when he got rung, I said, you need to have him wave at this ball. Y'all need to have him wave at the ball. And so about the third time, I, I grabbed him by the jersey. I said, tell your guys to fair catch the ball. You're going to have more injuries. <laughs> Not on purpose, right. but because here's a guy like this. And back then – you didn't have the halo rule for catching the ball. Right. And you could come right into hit. them and just mm. light them up. You'd see those gunners just leaving their feet a few feet, I mean, a few yards from them. And yeah. it, was, it was a missile coming at them. And we had, a, had another time in San Diego, and I'm warming up before the game. So I'm taking snaps from a long snapper and punting the ball, and I have a guy that comes up, and he's literally shoulder to shoulder, almost pressing into me from San Diego and he's he's talking to my ear and he goes does this bother you and I'm like no you can stand wherever you want and he's I tell he's really trying to get in my head mm -hmm. so I catch the ball kick one he's there again same thing does this bother you and he says I, I'm because I'm gonna be here all day this that's why I'm asking you I said you stay wherever you want <laughs> so sure enough that goes that goes on for about four or five kicks in, in pregame yeah. didn't bother me we get in the game I think it was the second punt of the game. I get the ball off, but I feel somebody come across me. And I, I went down and looked up. I got the flag, so I know we're getting the first down. And I start to get up, and I hear this noise behind me. And this guy's crawled up in the fetal position, and he's coughing and yelling and everything else. I guess I got him in the bullseye, which all of y'all can figure out where that is. <laughs> and I went over to him, and he is, I'm serious, he is coughing so bad. I finally just, I bent over to him. I said, does this bother you? Because I'm going to be here all day. <laughs> and just, you know, turn it back to him. But, um, you know, karma, karma has a way, you know. Yep. It does. It does, even in sports. Well, well, Jim, let's transition because you're, you're involved in what I think to be just an outstanding program with the Detroit Lions. We were talking about it for a few minutes, and I suspect not a lot of people either outside of the NFL or outside of Detroit know much about this. And I, I know you're proud of it, and I want you yep. to share 
this program that you're involved with that, that benefits former players for the, the Lions? Well, I, uh, I'm part of what we call our peer pride group. And we named that um, because it's peer to, it's a peer-to-peer -peer program. Um, it was born out of 9-11. Um, there was a lady uh, out of um, Rutgers who developed a program post 9-11 for first responders. But the program that she had was a call-in program. So what we did was we turned and we flipped the script. So we are an active outreach. And what we did uh, in, in um, starting this program, which really was the birth child of Eric Hippel, um, was to, one, we want to do an outreach program. Two, we partnered with Henry Ford Health Systems. So a part of my job is to reach out to the uh, list of former guys to let them know what's going on in and around the league with the Lions uh, as well, but also to try to get a little deeper with guys to see um, if there are issues. And what I mean by that, if, if a guy has a problem with addiction, a depression, uh, even to the point of someone is contemplating suicide, then we have a program in place to touch these guys. And if there's an issue that we need, we can plug them into, we got concierge care we can get them to. Um, I mean, to the point of where we have almost like a uh, national emergency SWAT team, if you will. If I know a guy's is really on the edge and is thinking about, you know, committing suicide, we can get a rescue um, team to him uh, almost immediately, just like as you would an EMS. But it's a program that, as it started and, and then partnering with Henry Ford Health Systems, um, had to, for this thing to be possible and to be successful, had to have the um, buy-in of the ownership. We've had that from the Ford family, and especially most recently with Martha Ford, um, which is critical. Our, we've been doing it for about four years. Our goals in this are one, to make sure that our former guys are healthy, um, that they do have choices that, that can help them if they need that. But on top of it, we wanted this to be something that we could take and we could set the template and be the example or the beta test group, if you will, they could go to the entire league. So each team could be able to implement this thing um, with success. But there, the factors with it are just what I talked about. For a team to adopt it, you have to have them the want to do it, but you also have to have ownership buy-in. Um, if you do that, then you have the chance for the program to be successful rather than it to be an ancillary satellite um, program that you don't know if there's traction or not. And we, we have ways that we report back to the Lions to let them know what we're doing, how many people we've touched, what's going on, do we need to get somebody here? This is the, you know, we did have, we don't, we don't divulge names, it's all private. Um, so we get this person to this facility to go through um, whatever it may be. And the thing about it is, is more and more and more what you're seeing is programs that are out there to help that depression, um, you know, so it doesn't go as far as it, you know, that far in addiction. Um, one of the things we try to do is um, when we're, we go to an away game every year and we try to, we try to couple ourselves with former players from another team to do something um, in the community. Last year we did that in Chicago and we did it with, um, a gym there, and the sole purpose of this gym and workout facility is to bring in former um, uh, military personnel who are just out. Maybe they, maybe they were one who were injured um, some way in in any kind of conflict we've had. Give them a facility where they can come on a regular basis, one to work out so they get the physical activity, but two, give them a forum where they can share with one another so now they can help the mental side of things with one another um, and then keep try to they try to keep building that so that they're, here's something that's a support group for them so here's an outreach that's not only player but goes out to a like place um, with veterans coming back into the real world what what a fantastic way to give back not just within the form for former players because i've never heard of of similar type organizations and it may just be that i'm unaware jim but this sounds so unique and the fact that ownership is backing it that hopefully this will get more and more traction around the league. Now, not to get too deep into the woods, but does 
the NFL Retirement Association or the Players Association or part of the retirement, does it help pay for any of the services that may be needed? Or how does that get paid for? Is that a case-by-case basis? To be honest with you, I don't know how all of that's funded. I do know that our partnerships have done that. The league is doing things where guys can go and have checkups. As an instance, the trust, which is under the NFL Players Association, has a program where guys can do what they call a milestone testing. And they have two or three facilities. I went to the one at Tulane. And this is a physical program that they take through you, complete mind and body screening, that you cannot get going to your MD, your family practitioner. You're not going to get it. I mean, I had MRIs done of all my joints, x-rays. I had a CAT scan of my brain and spine. And all of this is done with specialists in each one of those areas and give you this. This is all done. This is not divulged to anyone, the league, or to an insurance company unless I give them permission to give my information out. Sure. So, yes, there are systems in place within the league that are there and are either no or low cost to the individual. And so we try to, that's, you know, part of what I do is try to get out and encourage guys to at least do this. And that's probably half the battle right there. Oh, yeah. I had a guy that I played DB with in Kansas City who went through this program down there and seemed very, very healthy. Through this complete scan, they were able to find, they found a spot on his lung. He's doing well. He's been able to get treatment, but they've caught this early enough to where now you can make a difference in somebody's life and not them go down the road. And then all of a sudden now it's worse and you're edited into invasive, not invasive, invasive or degrading drug rehab or not rehab, but pharmaceuticals and stuff that's going to degrade your body that not going to help that much. Well, Jim, I applaud yours and others' efforts. That is just fantastic work. So thank you for sharing that with our group about what you're doing to help to help with others, not just former players, but with with the former military who've seen action defending our country and they they too need need a break and need some help. But Jim, one thing one thing I'd say real quick, I want to say is Bernard, is that the guys that are listening, watching, or whatever, I had the the honor to be included. The Lions did this through an honor flight with veterans out of we went out of Kalamazoo, so we took a group of eighty veterans to Washington to tour all the memorials. It was, and we had we had veterans from World War Two all the way back to our most recent Afghanistan, but very moving for me, I think for them. And if anybody's out there and is plugged into anything like that and you have the opportunity to do that, do it. If it's a family member and they're invited on one, please call and be a a volunteer to be their guardian. It will change your perspective. Anyway, I just want to get that plug in. No, that's that's fantastic. And Jim, I could talk to you all night, but but I know we got to wrap this up in the next minute or two. But I want to thank you for sharing your story, sharing some time with us and all the the Vandy uh, Commodores Nation, a little bit about what you're doing now and some of those great stories from from back in the day. And and I got to do rapid fire with you real quick. Oh, gosh. Okay. Best athlete you played with or against in college? Herschel Walker against. Oh, there's a mic drop right there. Yep. Best best athlete you played with or against in the pros? Barry Sanders. Oh, another mic drop. Can't get any better than that. Best football memory from on the field while you're at Vanderbilt? Uh, Well, I've got several, and they're all due that senior season. Um, The victory at the start of the season against, I think, Maryland, beating Mm -hmm. Florida, a ranked team at the time, which I think got us over the hump and made us believe we could do anything. Beating Tennessee at home, that was – it was fantastic. I mean, we went into we went in the locker room after the game, and they said, "Y'all got to come back out." And uh, it was just it was fantastic. Those memories will never fade. That's awesome. All right, best 
favorite class that you took at Vanderbilt? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I took a little sociology class with a professor there. And this professor could sit in a normal chair, short guy. And when he sat, his feet were like this far off the ground. <laughs> if you painted him green and gave him pointed ears, he was Yoda. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Two more I got for you. Where'd that, you live your freshman, where, where'd you live your four years? Where on campus or off campus? Uh, freshman year was in Branscombe Quadrangle, Lupton Hall. Um, sophomore, junior, senior was Tower 2. Rest in peace, Tower 2. Rest in yes. peace. Um, last question. Where's one of your, your, a couple of your favorite places in or around campus or in town where you guys like to go get beer and pizza and just, just hang out? Well, they're gone now. We had Amy's. We had Jonesy's. Those were gone. Uh, the substation, which is right across from the towers at the time, is gone. Um, Lord, those right around campus, those were really kind of our haunts when I was there. I tell you what's still there is Rotiers, and I had a yep. burger there a few, few months ago. That place, I don't think that's ever going anywhere. But, Jim, thank you, my friend. I, I've, I've really enjoyed our time talking tonight, and I just I wish you the best and, and health and happiness, and I hope our paths cross again soon. Well, thanks so much, and to all the guys, former players, and everything. Love you guys very much, uh, former teammates, Vandy Faithful. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me on. I really do. My pleasure, guys. And that'll be it for this week's Commodore, uh, Conversations with Commodores. I've got coming up uh, in the upcoming weeks, Corey Harris, Kurt Page. I'm going to try to get Watson Brown back on. We've got a bunch of folks coming up in the upcoming weeks. You guys have a good night. Good rest of your week. Take care.